Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm doing a video for the Indie Recon Fantastic Conference all about how to make a living with your writing, which I hope will be of a lot of interest to everyone. And of course, you can share on Twitter and Facebook and wherever you like um, and use the hashtag Indie Recon so other people from the conference can share. Okay, let's get on with it. So just a little introduction, uh, if you don't know about me, just so you know, I do make a living from my writing, um, but I'm split into uh, two kind of personalities. Uh, I write thrillers as J.F. Penn, and uh, I'm also uh, the creative pen, uh, where I'm a professional speaker, and I have non-fiction books, uh, and also I have various other forms of income that I will explain in this uh, video but essentially I left my day job as an IT consultant in September 2011 so as of right now um, March 2015 I've been uh, three and a half pretty much three and a half years now uh, as a full-time author entrepreneur and I'll explain uh, that as we go through so I'm being very open with you today about how I make my living in the hope that that will help you as well. And you can see how many books I have, by the way. When I left my job, I had uh, three fiction and a couple of non-fiction, and I'd been working about uh, three years part-time on my website. So uh, it was definitely mature. And I'll talk a bit later about giving up, a, giving up the job, if that's something you want to do. But just to take you back even further, this is me in 2008 um, uh, with my very first book, um, Bright-Eyed, Bushy-Tailed. I was actually a, a management consultant working with uh, large corporates and small consultancies. I used to implement accounts payable into companies. So uh, that's kind of my history. So I do come from a business background and so I bring that uh, kind of attitude into this writing world now. All right, so when we talk about making a living with your writing, it's very important to decide what is a living <laughs> because there are writers, I know several who have moved to cheaper countries to live. So for example, I live in central London <laughs> in England, which is pretty expensive to be honest. Uh, I, you know, I could be living the life of a very rich person if I moved to say Bali or um, Eastern Europe or Asia. And there are people who do that. So when you talk about a living, you have to decide what that level is. So for example, do you want a big house um, with loads of furniture? And that's actually the house I used to own in Australia. Um, or do you want to be a bit more free? Um, that's my bike and my backpack and my Kindle, which is pretty much what I like to, to um, own these days. Uh, so I definitely did downsize when I wanted to change careers. And so it's more about deciding what do you value, what is non-negotiable, and designing a life, not just another job. So I want you to think about that as we go through, uh, really challenge yourself to consider what is the life that you want to design. And like this actually came to me recently, well, just this last week, I was actually speaking in, in America and in Charleston, and then I went down to Savannah and, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoyed being there and it was great. I always loved being somewhere new. But when I got back, I was so happy and it, it occurred to me that I have actually designed a life I don't want to escape from. <laughs> Whereas when I had a day job uh, as a consultant, all I ever wanted to do was escape and always wanted to go away. But here, I also really look forward to coming back because I love my life and my work and, and where I live. So happy times. So this is very important as we go through what is a living. You need to put a financial number on it and that needs to cover your living costs. If you have a family, health care, uh, insurance, all of those types of things. So uh, be very realistic about that as we go through. Also, what are you willing to change to live that life? So, uh, and what are you willing to give up? So, as I mentioned there, that, you know, that was a house I, I used to own <laughs> and uh, we downsized considerably in order for me to change uh, my very high paid consulting job uh, to become a creative professional to make a living with my writing. So I want to be very clear on that, you know, I made choices around, um, you know, ownership of things and I'm very happy doing all the things I do now without owning a big house with loads of stuff. Um, but I know many people don't want that type of life. So I want to be really realistic about uh, some of the things that 
are important if you want to make a living from your writing. So another important thing is to consider that the journey of an author is uh, to entrepreneur and kind of full-time living is an arc and I call it an arc uh, or it's a journey um, and most people, many people watching this may be on the I want to write a book or the I've written one book and uh, of course the whole world wants to write a book. Uh, far fewer people actually do manage to write a book but in terms of how many make a living as uh, with their writing it's a lot less so uh, I've put me on there as kind of I've written 12 books I run a business as an author I make a full-time living um, with my writing uh, and then I've got uh, Barbara Freethy, Bob May and of course there's a whole load of other people there uh, who many of whom are speaking at the Indie Recon conference as well people like H.M. Ward, C.J. Lyons, um, lots more people uh, who have written kind of 20, 30, 50 books and a sort of CEO of their global media empire, which is where I'm definitely heading. So again, you've got to decide at what, you know, at what point you're making a living and then at, at what point you're sort of running that, you know, you're that CEO role of, of the, the business. But remember, it is a journey and it's not a rush and it's not a race. So take it at your own pace. So the next important thing that really kind of builds off that last one, if you have one book that you publish with one company, uh, whether that is Amazon through KDP Select, or if you go with one publisher, one book with one publisher, however that's done, is one source of income. And uh, this is something I care about very deeply because in uh, 2008, along with many other people, um, I was laid off from my job. Or, you know, on one day, 400 of us were laid off from our department, just a pile of letters handed out uh, during the global financial crisis. Now, um, you know, I got another job after that, not a problem. But the point is that one source of income was cut off on one day and that's what you can't do if you want to make a living and a, a successful living over time so don't rely on one source of income uh, for your money develop multiple streams of income and this is very important and it's why I call myself an author entrepreneur because these are you know I I don't just rely on book sales, as I'll go through in a minute. So developing multiple streams, that can be multiple books published on multiple platforms, so you're not dependent on any one platform for all your income. Uh, but you have to consider how you're going to do this. This could be your day job plus a small amount coming in from your publishing. And over time, you can switch up the balance, as I did. I went from full-time work to four days a week before I actually quit my job uh, over three years. So very important principle, multiple streams of income. And as we go through this presentation, I will talk about my multiple streams. And of course, yours may well be different. So now we get into the exciting part and uh, I hope to inspire you with the possibilities of being an author. And the first thing to consider is scalable. So thinking scalable. Now, this is a magic word. Um, think about your day job and you get paid per day, per month, uh, a set amount. So based on the hours you work. So you get a certain amount of leave, for example, but essentially you get paid for the hours you work and you work one hour, you get paid a certain amount. There's no way of raising that amount regularly unless you get pay rises uh, and that amount is the same regardless doesn't matter so you work the hour you get paid once for that time and that's it and that's another hour off your life <laughs> but scalable income is kind of magic because you create it once and you can sell it forever now that's just when the penny drops on this it's just fantastic because that means you can work x amount of hours or days or months or years even on your book and that time is not wasted that time that the income that you can earn from that book can go on for for your whole lifetime plus 70 years after you die according to copyright law so that is pretty incredible when you think about it you can leave a legacy for your family or whoever um you know after your death so that's super so think about creating assets that will put income in your pocket for years to come. And that's how I like to think about the books. It's not just about that launch week. It's not about this spike of income that then disappears, which is the traditional uh, publishing model, really. This is the little bits of income that come in every month for years and years and years. So that's very exciting. So think scalable is the first way to consider making a living. 
So many people think that uh, when they have a finished book, uh, like his How to Market a Book, for example, that this is just one book. But it's not just one book. <laughs> it's actually lots of income streams is how you should think about it. So first of all, think about the ebook edition. So it's not even one format really anymore. Uh, so you create a format for Kindle, for example, you create another file for Kobo, one for iBooks, one for Nook, one for Smashwords, one for Draft a Digital, one for, you know, whoever the other ebook platforms you're uh, publishing on, ebooks of forever, uh, the new library platform from Joe Comrath. There are lots and lots of ebook editions that you could be creating so but let's just you know say that there's four the four big five big ones let's say five big ones five distribution platforms and then in print obviously you can have print you can use create space ingram spark you can sell your print rights but print is another uh, format it's another stream of income and then audio edition which is really exciting and uh, i've just uh, today actually is my launch for business for authors uh, which is how to be an author entrepreneur in audio format and there's lots of ways to do audio and that adds another stream of income uh, to your portfolio so you've pretty much got you know even if you want to say three or three, between three and seven um, different formats, I guess you could say, all from different companies, all different streams of income. So then multiply that by the country markets that these can be available in. And I'll talk more about global stuff later. But essentially, at the moment, we can sell 100 in over 100 countries, and I've personally sold ebooks in 65 countries. So if you multiply by country markets, uh, often called territory, uh, which are sort of groups of uh, markets uh, in the traditional publishing world, then you can see that you can, again, multiply those streams of income by country, which is very exciting. And then also people are moving into selling in different languages. So you can look at, okay, uh, you know, there are, there are obviously lots of languages and you can sell your foreign rights. Um, you can do translations with narrators, uh, you know, sorry, with translators. There are lots of things you can do to get your books out in different languages. And Germany, for example, is German language, probably the next big one, Portuguese for Brazil, which is an emerging market, Spanish for the US and other South American countries. There's a lot, and Spain, obviously, there's a lot of options. So if you think about you don't just have the one book. This may look like one book, but it's actually multiple streams of income just on its own. And then if you start thinking about multiplying the number of books you have, you can see the potential to make a living from your books. Now that is exciting. So just a little bit more on ACX uh, for audiobooks, because I think this is uh, an area where many authors need to look at getting into audio. Uh, there's a couple of options with ACX. You can do a royalty split deal where you don't pay anything up front. You just split the royalties with a narrator. If you have a platform, several books, a good series, this is something you could consider. Um, you can also pay up front. So you own all the rights and you get the royalty. You can also record your own audiobook, which is what I've just done for Business for Authors, which is very exciting. So uh, you can do any of these and it adds, uh, you can see there on the screen, um, it adds the, the audible audio version onto your book on Amazon, looks very professional. It's available on iTunes, Audible and Amazon. And uh, yeah, I definitely think you should check out ACX. Also, even if you are traditionally published and you, uh, you should check your contract to see if you still own the audio rights to your book, because you can exploit them yourself, even if you have a publisher. So that's a possible source of income for everybody. All right, let's talk about business models related to books. So I want to bring this up because there's a trend in, certainly in the indie world, in the self-publishing world right now, to consider this high volume production model as the only way. Uh, so we're, you know, mainly because the romance authors in particular are doing incredibly well um, with their high volume production. Uh, Barbara Freethy is there, H.M. Ward is someone who's speaking at the Indie Recon conference and certainly someone I, um, you know, look at as a tremendous success in this high volume production model. Um, I've also put there Steve Scott, SJ Scott, who's doing very well in nonfiction with a high volume production. But of course, not everybody is uh, high volume production um, capable 
or wants to be. So, and that's a really important point. Many people are writing books that take longer, uh, literary fiction that involves, you know, perhaps more thought, uh, less genre uh, focused work, um, you know, longer non-fiction works that involve a lot more research. There are many people or even personality types where the high volume production model doesn't really fit. Um, you know, I do, I've, I guess I'm kind of halfway to that. I do, by some people's standards, I write quite fast. By other people's, I write very slowly. So, um, you know, we shouldn't compare ourselves to others, of course. But in terms of using these models, I do have, you know, I am aiming for that high volume production for my fiction series. But this is not the only model. There are other models too for book related income. So book as lead gen to back end sales or lead generation, if you're not familiar with that term. Uh, a couple of examples here, Chris Gillibo, uh, traditionally published uh, The Happiness of Pursuit. Chris is a very successful blogger, runs um, a very big conference and um, also has a lot of courses on his website. So the book, and is a speaker, a paid speaker. So um, the book leads people to his website, which facilitates the rest of his business. The same with Jim Kukra who runs Author Marketing Club, um, you know, who does now self-publish, but uh, is mainly his books are there as lead generation for Author Marketing Club and uh, Jim's consulting and speaking business. Uh, and then, of course, the book as the way into teaching or speaking, which I do, uh, you know, how to market a book, for example, um, and business for authors. I do a lot of paid professional speaking based on these books. So they are... Um, you know, and actually this is a good point. Um, the reason this is quite a long book is because I use it as almost like a course book for my training courses on marketing and my speaking. If you're, whereas uh, someone like Steve Scott would have split that book into probably four or five smaller books. That's a chunky book, 70,000 words. Uh, it could be split into smaller books uh, if I were going for the high volume production model, for example. So when you're thinking about how you're going to publish your book, it is a great idea to consider which of these business models you're thinking about uh, and then go that way. Um, I mean, a lot of literary fiction authors teach writing, teach creative writing, and that the book can sort of be a business card to get into that model. And of course, you can use them all as I do. All right, so if you want to make a living from your writing, you have to think about things in a more commercial manner. So let's first consider um, the brilliant site authorearnings.com, which has some excellent uh, data on the book, the top selling books on Amazon. And they have they do this every quarter now. So you can go and have a look on that site and check out the data. But the first consideration is if you want to make a living writing books that people actually want to buy. Now, this could be controversial because many of us, certainly I did and still do to a point, you know, really I do, you know, write books that are from the heart first. But equally, if you are right, say, let's take poetry as the most extreme example. Poets don't write poetry for the money. <laughs> they write poetry for the love of writing poetry and the love of language. So when we're talking about making a living with your writing, most poets don't. Um, it's very rare for poets to make a living just by being a poet. So in terms of writing books that people want to buy, if you want to sell a lot of books, you do have to think about the genre that the books are in. So for example, uh, I write thrillers. Now, some people, you know, my books are kind of at the more intellectual end. Certainly my London Psychic series is a more intellectual end of crime thriller, but I still would rather it was categorised that way than put in literary fiction because more people buy mysteries and thrillers. So I'm just being hardcore about this, um, you know, and this graph shows very clearly that nearly 70% of the top, I think this is 50,000, yeah, 50,000 best-selling ebooks on Amazon, 69% are genre fiction and the vast majority of those also romance, uh, romance, mystery, thriller, sci-fi, fantasy. If you want to write, uh, if you want to make a living with high volume fiction, for example, these are the genres to write in. Uh, you can see there the fiction and literature green 
segment is only 5%, that would be uh, your literary fiction and poetry, probably. Um, and children's books, they're 3% now. Remember, this is ebooks, not print. I do believe children's books will be taking off with the advent of Kindle Kids ebook creator, I think it's called, which is the new. Um, uh, platform to you know do more exciting things with children's books on Kindle Fire and that type of thing. Uh, so essentially, it's very important for you to do your research if you want to make a living. You're not going to make stacks and stacks of cash if you're writing one literary fiction novel every five years, uh, unless you are Donna Tart. <laughs> I think it was every ten years. <laughs> but um, anyway, there are of course breakout successes, but you know, we're planning on making a living here. So you have to be, uh, you know, have to think more pragmatically, I guess. So have a look at the Amazon top 100, look at iBooks, look at the New York Times list, look at the Sunday Times in the UK, whatever. Have a look at what people are buying um, and uh, make sure that you understand how those lists are done. So for example, the WH Smiths in the UK, uh, those slots are bought, they're not based on popularity. So that's really important to make sure you look at popularity, which is why Amazon is a better list often. Okay, so the other thing is if you write non-fiction, uh, think about writing books that people want by search. So Amazon uh, is a search engine and people ty often type questions in and uh, find books around those topics. So uh, the reason, again, why I wrote how to market a book is because people search for the phrase how to market a book. Uh, that seemed like a not a clever title, but an SEO title, search engine optimized title. So here, if you go and if you go onto Amazon and, you, you know, start typing anything, uh, you know, go to the Kindle store area, start typing anything, you'll see there's a drop down. These are searches that are going on every day, the most popular searches. So if you write a book with one of these titles, um, how to be a Christian without being religious, for example, uh, you know, if you wrote a book with that title, you may well be uh, found in when people are searching for that. The question is also how many people are searching for this. So you need to, you know, have and, and how many competitors there are. This is why fiction um, keywords tend to be more difficult, like paranormal romance, for example. But here you can see, um, I imagine that how to be a cuckold is uh, not a particularly overdone um, book term, book title, uh, but might be interesting to have a look at. Um, so how have I used this myself? Yes, so my first book, as you saw earlier, was called How to Love Your Job or Find a New One. And even though I rebooted the cover later on, uh, I then discovered this kind of keyword thing and decided to change the title as well. So I changed the title to Career Change and you can see there the number of searches and that is from Google uh, search terms, key Google keyword search terms. So you can have a look at that. Um, but essentially the number of searches for career change are streets ahead of like 10 times the amount of how to love your job, uh, which doesn't even come up on Amazon. So I changed my title and it made a real difference to the sales. Uh, the, you know, the book actually sells as opposed to not selling at all. So, and I don't have a platform for career change at all. It's not something i talk about on my website very much or you know I don't aim for that career change niche at all. So if you're writing non-fiction consider writing books that people want by looking at search terms. So another tip whether you're writing fiction or non-fiction is to write a series and get people hooked into that series or have branded non-fiction titles in a niche. So again, I'm using the example of H.M. Ward here, who is her arrangement series right now is on number 18, um, really gets people hooked in. Steve Scott has uh, is focusing on the habit niche and has multiple books on habits. So if you are interested in productivity, you're likely to buy several of those books. Um, and I have my Arcane series. Uh, what this does is it sort of feeds into the binge consult consumption culture that's going on right now. Um, you know, when when uh, Netflix dropped uh, House of Cards, for example, uh, all at once, people just binge watched the whole thing over a weekend. Um, we certainly did it over a couple of weeks, but still, you know, you want to watch the whole thing fast as possible. The same thing is when people discover a series that they love, they want to binge read everything. So, 
you know, thinking about your backlist, how many books you have. If you're writing in a series, whether it's fiction or non-fiction, it's easier to write because you have your characters, you have your world, you just have to find a new plot for the books. Um, so that really helps uh, with income. You can also put the first in the series free to draw people in. And uh, many authors certainly note an income at book three and book five. I noticed a, in a drop, uh, sorry, a drop. <laughs> I noticed an increase at book three in my series and uh, I've just continued writing in that series. The other way, of course, we're talking about multiple streams of income is to write across multiple genres. Um, and many people use different author names. You don't have to. Uh, but for example, um, Steve Scott there, SJ Scott for his habit books, Steve Scott for his kind of entrepreneur online marketing niche. Uh, I use Joanna Penn for uh, my non-fiction and I use JF Penn for my thrillers. Um, but then someone like Dean Wesley Smith uh, uses his own name for everything. He writes, uh, you know, fiction and non-fiction. And James Scott Bell also does fiction and non-fiction under his full name. So writing across multiple genres will mean you target different audiences um, and you can get more income from those different books. I also find it easier to switch between, uh, you know, I, I can't do like, thousands and thousands of words of fiction at once. But what I can do is a couple of thousand words of fiction, break, and then write some non-fiction because it's kind of a different part of the brain. So that's a very good um, example if, you're, if you want to create the multiple book scenario. And of course, we've talked um, about writing more books, but if you do want to make a living with your writing, obviously you'll be writing a lot. Um, and there's a good example there of Joe Comrath, who um, you know is, is tipped into the seven-figure mark. Um, Barbara Freethy, who is the highest earning author, um, Kindle author, I think it's four million she sold now, that's an older screen print, um, but uh, definitely top selling uh, indie author. And there's a lot of indies who have now hit uh, the seven figure mark, many of them in romance and many of them with a lot of books. So certainly, um, you know, you get more digital shelf space with more books and your total number of sales will grow even if you're selling, you know, a few copies of each book a month. So I mentioned going global and uh, I always love to share my Kobo writing life map uh, because it, it always makes me happy to see new countries uh, emerge on my map. Uh, Namibia uh, is there, Kenya there, uh, Nigeria, very exciting. Um, so, and of course, lots of others around the world. I just uh, focusing on Africa. Um, it, it's very... <sighs> It's very easy to, to just think, well, you know, the biggest market is the US, which you can see it is. And, you know, the other mature markets, Canada. Um, oh, well, this is obviously the biggest one here is Canada. This is Kobo. But the most people make the bulk of their income from sales in the US. Um, the UK is the, the big one in Europe there, Australia. Um, but remember, each of these other countries are starting to happen slowly. What we've got to think is we're only in the toddling years of digital. Um, an ebook adoption globally. Uh, so if you think that where we were five years ago, and five years ago, I mean, we were 2010, I, you know, I think the Kindle, had, there was certainly no Kobo, um, the Kindle had just come out internationally, um, you know, ebooks were just emerging previously, it had just been PDFs sold on people's websites. Um, you know, many people were doing that in the um, entrepreneurial space but in terms of commercial ebooks certainly in bookstores and unheard of um, so in five years the, the world has kind of radically changed around digital publishing self-publishing and, and in another five years we're going to see you know just as much of a shift in that the worldwide adoption will be changing and uh, you know I would say probably two years well two years ago I would have only have sold books in a couple of countries maybe five now my sales are in 65 countries um and growing every month, pretty much. And I think that's very exciting. Um, iBooks has 51 country stores. Amazon has 171 countries. You can get into all of these places. I mean, Google Play with Android, um, you know, all these stores have pretty global reach. So if your books are available uh, in all these countries, you know, that's fantastic. The other thing to consider, again, if you have a traditional publishing deal, is have I, uh, you know, have I sold my rights to Asia Pacific, for example? You know, could I self-publish in Australia? Could I self-publish in Asia? 
you know, have I just sold my US rights? Can I self-publish in other countries? If you've sold world English rights, you are pretty screwed. But if you haven't, consider, you know, self-publishing in other territories. And of course, you can use print on demand to sell through Amazon um, and they own a number of other print on demand services around the world, uh, Ingram Spark, that type of thing, you can reach people with print and audio as well as ebooks. So just talking about some of the trends also that I think will make a big difference to this, this future income uh, is, you know, mobile phone penetration, smartphone penetration. Uh, you know, it's got here by 2017, nearly 70% of the global market. And uh, I also love the fact that I mentioned Africa. The reason being is that it's jumped. It's jumped from, uh, you know, nothing to a cell phone economy. There, you know, you can see people with cell phones and smartphones all over Africa now running businesses uh, with cell phones, using apps to do all kinds of things. And this is why people are buying uh, ebooks now in Africa, South America, Asia, because they have smartphones, not because they are on a PC or a, um, a Mac or a laptop or whatever. They have skipped that and gone straight to mobile. So if you think about that that way, people who don't have access to a physical bookstore, for example, um, that's one of the main reasons ebooks were adopted in the US uh, so well, because many people lived in the middle of nowhere a long way from bookstores and digital became a really brilliant way to get books without driving four hours to the nearest town or whatever. Same in Australia. Um, so with cell phones, people can get stuff so much more easily. So that's a big deal. The other demographic shift we have is the move into cities. You know, look at anything, the move to urban um, places is, you know, gr grows around the world because that's where the money is. Um, smaller living spaces because denser accommodation. You know, again, I moved from a four bedroom house in Australia to a smaller flat in London um, where we live on top of one another, literally. But uh, it's such a brilliant city that it's well worth it. Um, there's also the trend towards less stuff. You'll hear phrases like the sharing economy, books like stuffocation, um, you know, people more willing to use things like uh, zip car and sharing cars and Uber rather than owning cars. Uh, this will continue to grow this kind of sharing economy. And of course, the rise of the digital native have you seen a two-year-old with an iPad? <laughs> so essentially, you know, this this is a shift. Um, this is a march that won't change. We won't lose print books, of course, but this digital shift is happening. The other thing is the ageing population. I saw an amusing um, tweet from someone who said, uh, isn't it weird that you can't change the font size on this print thing that I'm trying to read? Uh, and it's true. I mean, the ageing population likes digital, um, big market for uh, ebook readers in the over 60s because you can change the font size. And uh, that's pretty, pretty important um, if you think about that population and the audiobooks can read to you um, when you, you know, if you want to stop reading, for example, you can then listen. Which brings me on to another exciting thing and why you should definitely look at audiobooks for making a living as another stream of income. Uh, Apple CarPlay and Google Auto will become mainstream in the next year in all the biggest car manufacturers. So what we're going to see is streaming audio directly in cars without having to fiddle with attaching your smartphone to your car radio somehow uh, with your Bluetooth thing. You'll just be able to get in and deal with it. You can have your podcast, you can have your audiobooks. It will be, it will make these things mainstream. So you can leave your house, um, you know, stop reading on your device, get into the car, turn on your, the audio and it will, you know, with whisper sync on Amazon, it will just carry on reading from where you left off. So that's very exciting. Uh, just one thing there, uh, I think that this will also make a big difference to podcasting for marketing, uh, so definitely be looking at podcasting as the new guest blogging um, in the future. And of course, we've just heard about Google's algorithm change where your website will need to be mobile optimized in order for them to rank you highly in the search engines. So that is another kind of admission that we're moving to a very mobile centric world and authors have to consider that for their um, multiple streams of income. So the other thing 
really about if you want to make a living with your writing is you have to change your attitude about marketing. The number of people I hear who say, oh, I just want to write. <laughs> I don't want to do the marketing. Uh, well, you know, whether you get a traditional deal, whether you self-publish, you will have to do marketing. So it really is about changing your attitude. So marketing becomes part of the job as such. It becomes part of making a living and you'll make a better living if you change your attitude to marketing. So uh, this is how I reframed it and uh, this really helped me, which is marketing is sharing what you love with people who will appreciate hearing about it. So for example, you know, I love, um, I love action movies. I love the supernatural. I love uh, traveling. These are the things that I put into my fiction. So why wouldn't I want to share those with people who like similar books? Or, you know, I want to share my own, you know, love of what I do as a writer. So that's why I write books about um, marketing business for authors, that type of thing. And then if you think, you know, that if you, that naturally leads into sharing other things that you like, so I might share um, pictures of a, a graveyard I visited and put them on Twitter and some people will really like that um, and will maybe check out my books for example or I'll go to a conference and I'll share my lessons learned from Thrillerfest for example and that will uh, help other people so and that it markets me as an author uh, as much as anything but is also helpful so you definitely need to change your attitude if you want to make a living with your writing. So let's talk about other streams of income and just on the blog, uh, the blog as writing, because of course main, most people are writing on their blogs, of course there are video blogs um, and podcasts, but we are talking about making a living with your writing at the moment. So uh, do you need a blog or other kinds of written content on the internet? Well, my opinion is if you do high volume production, fiction or non-fiction, you probably don't need a blog. Um, or anything else. You just need a, a website where you can collect email addresses, for example, for your marketing efforts. Uh, this is the, you know, so for the high volume fiction production and, and non-fiction, you don't need a blog, although many authors do anyway for the love of writing and sharing with others. But if you want to do the book as lead gen, um, the book as a way for teaching, speaking and other sales off a website uh, as I do, then yes, you probably do need a way to share other content uh, as a form of content marketing that will attract the right people to your website. So it really depends on your business model. But if we look at uh, my own business model around a blog and many other people's, there are mainly five income streams from a blog. There may be more, uh, but these are the ones that I use um, and we'll be talking about. So first of all is the product sales. So books, courses, audios, downloadable things that people can pay for. Uh, and there's lots of ways you can sell those direct from your website, for example. Uh, paid professional speaking. So um, my website certainly brings me speaking opportunities around the world uh, for which I am paid. So that is another way for the blog to be useful. Uh, consulting or services, and those services may include freelance writing. Many freelancers have blogs to showcase their work and attract clients. Sponsorship or advertising, which is mainly traffic based. You're not going to get sponsorship or advertising if you have no traffic or very low traffic to your website. And traffic often comes with content. So you will need a blog or podcast or video, whatever, if you want to make money that way. And in fact, sponsorship and advertising is the way most YouTubers will make a living. Uh, and then affiliate income, which is, and the difference there is sponsorship and advertising, you get paid for doing a certain thing. So, you know, mentioning a product or, um, you know, per number of click throughs. Um, affiliate income is you get a percentage of the sale. So I sell someone else's product and I get a percentage. So those are some of the uh, business uh, sort of income streams, multiple income streams around a blog. But also there are other reasons to have a blog. Um, and I've put here reputation, social proof and traffic, obviously marketing. Um, and these are some of the other things. I mean, for me, it's been amazing. I would say that being a blogger has changed my life. Um, that's me speaking in Bali and in Stockholm and, and on Sky News uh, one morning. You know, so certainly you can get on media, you can develop your voice, find a community, and that community can lead to 
at many things. So um, when I was in that Deadly Dozen box set and we hit the New York Times and the USA Today, that was based on a relationship, based on community, based on my blog and the platform I have. So it attracts opportunity to put your words out there on a professional looking site. Um, But when you do it, you should really think about these type of things because I see too many writers blogging with no real thought about these questions. Uh, Who do you want to attract? How can you help them or entertain them? Remember, people want inspiration, education or entertainment. So one of those three things you should be doing or more than one. Uh, What do you want them to do on your website? So sign up for an email, buy a product, that type of thing. And how does the site add to your business? If you want to make a living from your writing, you have to consider the flow of money to do with the website. Um, How is the site monetized? And is there a point to the blog? Is it just therapy for yourself? Or is it aimed at attracting people for financial reasons? That may change over time. I certainly... Uh, my first blogging experiences before the creative pen were entirely kind of hobbyist. Um, and then I decided that I would have a more business focused site. So really think about that when you are looking at how to make a living. So just briefly on each of those income streams from uh, from the blog or from a website uh, idea. First of all, product sales. So um, I've certainly done uh, video courses over the years, you know, video a bit like this, going deep into various topics. Um, there's Udemy, which is a very popular um, place to sell these types of courses now, or you can sell them from your own website. But I would say that it's very important to do your research into what people want that keyword research, that market research, what do people want, and then build something people want, very similar to the way we talked about writing non-fiction books earlier. And obviously you wanna relate it to your work somehow by cross-selling. So, I mean, you could do something like, um, for fiction authors, you can can do something like write a best-selling thriller and then um, use your own thrillers as, or romance or whatever, as examples. Um, but that's still not gonna have a massive Uh, sale rate compared to things well just go and have a look on Udemy you'll see what's selling it's it's actually fascinating Um, you know decide on how you want to sell it Uh, do you want to do a site like Udemy do you want to go from um, your own website uh, you know and I promote Learn Scrivener Fast for example Um, you know there are other products like book design templates which is also fantastic which are templates for Um, authors so they can do their, uh, so you can do your own uh, book formats easily. So think about what people actually want, deliver that and you will sell things which is quite exciting. Uh, And the main thing to think there is you you will get a higher price if you do multimedia. So if you do video and audio it will, you can price it higher than a book. Okay if you want to make an income stream from professional speaking Uh, which I do, I really recommend that you start speaking for free, get some experience, get some testimonials, and then start looking for opportunities. Put a speaking um, tab on your website so people know you are a speaker, or put hire me as a speaker or something, and on your business card, put speaker. Um, These things are very important for advertising the fact that you do this. Uh, Also get some training, join a professional organisation. I joined the PSA in uh, Britain. Uh, I also joined the um, NSAA in Australia, the National Speakers Association, and of course there's one in America as well. Um, And realistically, those those organisations work to help you become a professional speaker, as in a paid speaker. If you join something like Toastmasters, which is also brilliant, the aim is not really to become a paid speaker, but more a good speaker. So, you know, obviously the PSA and NSA, etc., want you to be a good speaker and a paid speaker. So it's more a level of professionalism, whether you want to learn confidence through something like Toastmasters or join a professional organisation and get the higher level training, which is what I did. Uh, the other thing is in terms of your speaking rates, um, <laughs> aim for markets, uh, you know, if you can, aim for markets who will pay higher rates. Um, if you speak for things like author conferences like I do, the speaking rates will be a lot lower than if you speak for uh, companies. So the price for speaking fees heavily depends on the industry. So consider that if you want this to be a significant income stream. And uh 
I can't go into too much detail here, but I have a, a book on uh, public speaking for authors, creatives, and other introverts. Uh, if you're interested in having a look at that, it shares everything that I've learned about speaking over the years. Okay, then you can also offer services. So this might be freelance writing, coaching, consulting, that type of thing. Uh, I offer very occasional consulting services um, to people. I, I prefer people to buy my books for a lot lower price, um, but I do have some services and that's um, my friend Mark McGuinness, who's a poet and creative coach um, at Lateral Action. And he's also speaking at Indie Recon too. So, um, you basically need to develop a reputation, show authority, again, usually by blogging and podcasting and all that content, um, but include the option of people hiring you early on and you might be surprised what happens. Certainly many authors, indie authors now offer, uh, if they have design skills, they're doing formatting or cover design. Uh, some people are doing editing. Some people are doing, you know, all these types of things that we need as authors. Um, so it's always nice to to hire another author who's who's doing this. Um, but definitely do some work for free, get some testimonials and uh, see how it goes. And if you want to do freelance writing work, and remember this is work for hire, this is not uh, scalable work and you're not creating your own assets, uh, I recommend these two websites, Make a Living Writing and The Right Life. Uh, both of these have a lot of information about freelance writing work, uh, if that's something you want to do. So then briefly on sponsorship and advertising, um, I have a podcast that is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life and 99designs. Um, so, you know, they're paid per episode that I do that. Um, you can really only get this type of income stream if you develop a niche audience and you have a decent sized list and traffic and you have a regular way of talking to those people. So you need that kind of recurring traffic. You also need evidence of that traffic. You need to have, uh, you know, Google Analytics data, podcast um, hosting data that you can show to advertisers to prove the size of your audience. Um, and over time, people will approach you um, or which happened to me, um, or you can also talk to appropriate companies about this uh, proactively. And certainly many people, many companies are now sponsoring podcasts. So uh, that's uh, another good income stream. And then affiliate income is also based on traffic because you need to send traffic to someone else's product and then you receive a percentage. Um, again, developing a niche audience. So I have a niche audience at the Creative Pen of writers. And so I have some products that I use myself and I think that's very important that I recommend and receive affiliate payment from. So I, you know, in terms of ethically, I think it's very important to only recommend services that you think are good. And, you know, uh, you also need to be upfront that things are affiliate links and then promote those products in an authentic way. So I do webinars and I have blog posts about the various services. And, uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very happy with the few things I promote because I use them all myself. So those are the main income streams for making a living with your writing. Of course, there are others, um, but those are the main ones that I make my own living from. Um, but if you want to make a living from your writing, it really is important to learn the business. Um, you know, you can, if you learn the craft, you will be able to write books. But unless you learn about the business, you're unlikely to make a living from your writing. Uh, and even if you have an agent and a traditional publisher, you still need to understand the money flow and your rights and how to manage this life um, because uh, there's, a, there's a great book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber which is very important because it talks about the problem of specialists going freelance and running their own business um, because most people are experts and they you know use the example of a plumber if someone is a really good plumber you know, working for a plumbing firm, and then they leave that plumbing firm to run their own plumbing business, you suddenly realise you need to attract customers, make sales, process the money, do the taxes, uh, all the things that you need to do on top of the actual work. So equate that to writing, you don't just write the books, you also need to attract the customers, whether that's agents, publishers or readers, you need to do the marketing, you need to do the books, you need to do accounting, these types of things. So, and this should be looked on as fun. <laughs> I certainly enjoy it all. Uh, that's why I'm a very happy, um, happy author, entrepreneur, 
I guess. Um, but it's also important to empower yourself about these things. Many authors are scared of words like business or entrepreneur, but if you understand how to make a living with your writing and you get to grips with this stuff, you'll be fine. I mean, you learned to write a book. You learned perhaps to self-publish, to be an indie author. You can learn the business of making a living with your writing. I also suggest continuing to learn from others because things change every week <laughs> in this crazy publishing world right now. Um, and I recommend the Alliance of Independent Authors who of course run Indie Recon and uh, we have great community, lots of information and uh, I do a monthly Q&A with Orna Ross who uh, is the founder of, of Ally and uh, lots of information for authors by authors uh, with no vested interest in things just sharing what works so definitely continue to learn from others so if you want to make a living from your writing at some point you're going to ask when should I quit my day job which I hear quite a lot when I speak on this topic well again let's just go back to the multiple streams of income idea don't quit your job if you just have one book uh, or you're writing a book and uh, you really that's not going to give you enough income to make a living, in my opinion, unless you get a massive book deal, which is a lightning strike that you can't rely on. So um, think about developing these multiple streams. These are just some of the different companies that I make money through every month. Um, when you have sustainable income from multiple sources and you're not so stretched, then you can consider giving it up. When you've downsized or you know, looked at your expenses and reduced them so you're under less risk. And I'm very low risk. Uh, when you know this is what you really want to do, there are plenty of people who write books who either love their jobs or don't want to write books uh, or write full time. It is difficult and it can m move it from something you love as a hobby to something that is linked to income and becomes less fun because of that. Uh, so you have to know that you want to do this. So for me, it was after three years of part-time work on the Creative Pen and writing books and JF Pen, and, uh, and I now earn about half of what I used to as a IT consultant at the end of a 13-year career. So um, I put there a quarter, that's because this is an older slide, but that's nice to know also that it has gone up. Uh, and this is another thing, I, I guess, I you know, the realistic aim of anyone, and my aim, my personal aim, is that at five years full time, which will be next year, 20, September 2016, at five years, I want to be making the equivalent of what I made uh, at uh, when I left my day job originally. So that's a good goal to have, um, but it takes time because, of course, with any job, you know, how much are you worth on day one? How much are you worth after a year? You're not worth much in any job. So think about that very realistically when do you start becoming valuable in an in a career probably after year five you know by year 10 you're very valuable so that's what the, that's the type of thing to keep in your mind um you know how does this equate to any other form of uh, employment i guess and so we've covered a lot in this session about the various aspects of making a living as an author. But one thing I've learned is strategy is choosing what you don't do as well as what you do do. <laughs> and uh, we all have limited time. So I've given you loads and loads of stuff. Um, but what you have to keep in mind is, you know, what do you really want? What is your definition of success? What is a living? What will help you create a body of work you're proud of in your life? Uh, whether that's books, whether that's other art, whether that's, you know, your family, whatever it is, what will you look back on and be proud of and also help you create a life you want to live right now? And we've talked all about the business side and about money and about income, but this is what's on my wall and that I look at every day. Have you made art today? So that's what it comes down to uh, for us as writers. Uh, if you want to make a living from your writing, this still is the core of your day. Um, but you do have to do all the other stuff too. But this is what it comes back to. Is this what you love? So I hope that has helped and uh, given you some inspiration and ideas about how you could make a living from your writing. 
and you can find me at thecreativepen.com or on Facebook or Twitter. You can check out my podcast, The Creative Pen Podcast, on iTunes and Stitcher or on the blog, which has over 210 episodes at this point, all free. Um, you can also get a free Author 2.0 blueprint and a video series if you want more video from me. Uh, and uh, you can get that at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint and you'll also get that um, basically how to be a successful author entrepreneur ebook, uh, the author 2.0 blueprint. Okay, so thanks for your attention today and I hope you've enjoyed the Indie Recon conference and yeah, all the best with making a living with your writing.